Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. How did the invasion begin? The Kremlin looked out at the world beyond its borders to its near abroad, and it didn't like what it saw. It was especially troubled by one country where it put so much time and effort into getting a friendly government. But despite all the Kremlin's work, that country was sitting down with a U.S. envoy, talking about further integration with the West. This was too much for Moscow. They decided to invade. Regime change could be achieved in just a few days, they thought. This was Christmas 1979, and the country was Afghanistan. Within days of invading, the Soviets killed the Afghan leader, Hafizullah Amin, and installed a friendly regime. Amin was a communist, a natural ally of Moscow, but he had committed the sin of looking west. Just two months passed between his meeting with a U.S. diplomat and when the Soviets took him out. Here's how that diplomat described that meeting in a cable back to Washington. Quote, I think he wants an improvement in U.S.-Afghan relations. The diplomat added that Amin seemed to want a long-range hedge against over-dependence on the Soviet Union. And that's one of the things that really scared the Soviets and motivated them to invade. As the New York Times notes, there was a real fear in Moscow that Afghanistan might switch loyalties to the West. Americans may have forgotten why the Soviets had but we all know what happened next. The long-standing strongman in the Kremlin, Leonid Brezhnev, high off his success in putting down a revolt in Czechoslovakia, was shocked to find that the Afghans resisted so fiercely. As we now know, they were getting some help too. We will continue our joint efforts in support of the freedom fighters' efforts to win back your country's freedom. Free people everywhere agree uh, that there can be no compromise on the goal of Afghan independence. And that means the total withdrawal of all Soviet forces and the full self-determination of the Afghan President people. Ronald Reagan, like Jimmy Carter before him, strongly opposed the Soviet invasion. The U.S. boycotted the Moscow Olympics in 1980, but also helped arm guerrilla fighters to kill Soviets. And Soviet soldiers, many of them conscripted, started dying in droves. So what did the Kremlin do in the face of this unexpected resistance? It turned to more brutal tactics and propaganda lies. Just listen to this 1987 ABC News report quoting Mohammad Najibullah, the Soviet-backed Afghan leader. Dr. Najibullah acknowledged the war has worked enormous hardships on the Afghan people. And his repeated refusal to give precise casualty or refugee statistics suggests those remain an embarrassment. Kabul and other northern cities are now under government control, but areas in southern and western Afghanistan are still being hotly disputed. And despite the government's claim for support, it seems the Afghan people's greatest wish is simply to be left alone. By the late 1980s, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev called the Afghan war a bleeding wound and said he wanted to pull out in the nearest future. Three years later, in 1989, the Soviet tanks rolled out of Afghanistan after losing tens of thousands of soldiers and after killing hundreds of thousands of Afghans. Within months, revolutions in other communist countries challenged Soviet dominance. The Berlin Wall came down. Soviet republics began declaring independence. And within two years, the Soviet Union itself had fallen. Today, it's hard not to think about the disastrous decades-long Russian occupation of Afghanistan, a debacle even bloodier than America's disastrous two-decade occupation that finally ended last summer. As with the USSR in 1979, Vladimir Putin believed his troops would make quick work of the invasion of Ukraine and underestimated the huge nationalist resistance they would face from the locals. And as in the 80s in Afghanistan, Russian forces in Ukraine have been beaten up, strung out, demoralized, and they've started to use increasingly brutal tactics, shelling civilians trying to flee the violence, using their artillery to close evacuation routes. And this week, the Russian government admitted to bombing a hospital in Mariupol, where footage appeared to show dazed pregnant women being evacuated from the rubble. The Russians claimed that it wasn't a working hospital, but a base for Ukrainian neo-Nazi militants. They even claimed on Twitter that the pregnant women were actors in makeup. Twitter deleted those tweets today for violating its standards. Putin seems to have overstepped, and that's led to politicians in the West raising the question of whether the Russians can again be bled dry in a long Afghanistan-style insurgent campaign. 
a very motivated and then uh, funded and armed uh, insurgency uh, basically drove the Russians out of Afghanistan. Um, obviously, the similarities are, are not uh, ones that you should uh, bank on, because uh, the terrain, the development uh, in urban areas, et cetera, is so different. But I think that is the model that people are now uh, looking toward. Hmm. Then what happened? So far, the current U.S. administration has already flooded Ukraine with more than 17,000 anti-tank weapons in the first week of the war, with plans for much more. But if we think about the Afghanistan analogy, we have to think about everything that followed. In Afghanistan, the U.S. gave money and war material to many foreign fighters who would end up fighting the U.S. after 9-11 and committing scores of atrocities against the Afghan people. How do we ensure that Western weaponry doesn't fall into the hands of far-right extremists in Ukraine, of which there are sadly quite a few, and don't end up being used against innocents? NATO is being much more open now about its efforts to help Ukrainian resistance than the U.S. was during the Soviet campaign in Afghanistan. In fact, some U.S. pundits are openly suggesting Russia's war in Ukraine could lead to the end of Putin in the same way that Afghanistan helped lead to the end of the Soviet Union. But there's a crucial difference between now and then, and that could mean all the difference for what Putin does next. You see, Soviet leaders didn't care much for Afghanistan itself, but Ukraine, according to Putin, is part of a greater Russian nation. For him, this war is about a kind of manifest destiny, making the stakes of failure much higher for him. And we should be clear, weakening Putin's Russia with an insurgent proxy war means that hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Ukrainians might die in the coming years. Of course, many are dying every day that Russia occupies the country right now. So could Ukraine turn into Putin's Afghanistan? Or is a Mujahideen-style insurgency out of Kyiv a dangerous fantasy? Joining me now, Javed Ali, who served in senior counterterrorism roles in the Obama and Trump administrations, now associate professor at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and retired Army Colonel Jack Jacobs, military analyst for NBC News and MSNBC, and a recipient of the Medal of Honor for his actions under fire in Vietnam. Thank you both for joining me this evening. Uh, Javed, let me start with you. When the war began, you wrote the United States, NATO, and other coalition partners should be studying the elements of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and implement similar measures with modern twists to halt further aggression and restore security in Europe. So what exact measures are you suggesting here? And if we keep moving weapons over there, how do we ensure that they don't end up in the hands of neo-Nazis or genocide heirs, the way we arm some really bad mujahideen in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Yeah, Mehdi, uh, thanks for that introduction. And I would argue that um, some of the measures that were put in place in the Afghanistan war going back uh, 40 years with the Soviet Union looks like, based on reporting that you've noted already in the piece, that is already uh, underway. Uh, the supply of um, small arms, anti-armor, uh, anti-aircraft weapons. One would think there's also probably some provision of intelligence as well to the Ukrainian military uh, to to further uh, have these precise um, uh, coordinated attacks and, and fires. So it looks like we are already implementing a similar campaign, but I agree there also has to be some realization that think of the second and third order effects in terms of who, where these weapons are going, who they're going to. And as you noted, there has been a far right extremist uh, element um, in uh, eastern Ukraine for several years now. So we have to make sure that those types of weapons don't fall into those hands. And Jack, you fought against a protracted insurgency before. How realistic is it to draw a line from Russian failures in Ukraine to an end of the Putin regime? And to get there, you're still talking about a lot more innocents dying first, right? Yeah, you do. There'll be a lot of people, unfortunately, killed and wounded in, in this. And who knows how long it's going to take for it finally to die down. But it's, it's going to be very, very unpleasant for a long period of time because the Ukrainians are going to continue to resist. The line from what's happening in the field to Putin is dotted at best. We have to remember that the people who are surrounding Putin were made extremely rich by Putin and by their relationship with him. And they don't have rubles. They have dollars. They have gold. They have other precious metals. They have, uh, they have property. Uh, and so the kinds of strictures that we're placing on the country is affecting the country of Russia it's not necessarily going to have a long-term effect 
on the relationship between Putin on the one hand and his generals and the oligarchs on the other. There'll be some short-term dysfunctions. But at the end of the day, all these people are rich, and they're rich because they're related to Putin. And unless and until they get fed up with what's going on, Putin is going to continue to remain in power as long as he can control that. He can control the flow of money. He can control those people. So whatever happens on the ground to Russian yeah. forces in, uh, in, in Ukraine doesn't necessarily, is not de de necessarily deleterious to Putin himself unless and until it really affects his other, his other constituency, and that is the Russian people, to the extent that they're so going to do something about it. So, Javid, we're sitting around talking about this Afghanistan-Ukraine comparison. You've written about it. Do you think Putin has this in the back of his head, too? Surely he must understand, be aware of it. He was in the KGB in the 1980s when it was happening. You know, one would think that he is absolutely aware of the fairly significant battlefield losses the, the Russians have taken so far. And no one knows what the, those numbers uh, truly are. Uh, um, U.S. intelligence leaders testified uh, to Congress this week. They've got low confidence estimates and a few thousand troops at least being killed. But that is a staggering number in only two weeks of the conflict. By comparison, the Soviets lost about 15,000 troops over the span of 10 years in Afghanistan, uh, going back from 1970. To 1989. So if the numbers are accurate, that means they've already lost about a third of, of uh, the combat troops they lost in 10 years of fighting in Afghanistan. And if you're President Putin sitting in Moscow, are you going to let these numbers further escalate? 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 uh, Russian dead. And if that's the case, that is a horrific outcome for the Russian military. And Jack, one other big difference from 1979 is we are living in an age not just of television uh, and cable news, but of social media. So on the one hand, you know, there's a limit to how much the Russians can cover up the crimes that are being committed uh, in this war. On the other hand, they're also pretty good at disinformation, especially online on social media. Uh, how much do you think that affects the prospects of a successful insurgency against a foreign occupying force? Yeah, I think that the, the Ukrainians are going to carry on, and the, it doesn't really matter how much... Putin can restrict the flow of information inside his own country. Uh, the Ukrainians are going to carry on doing what they're doing because they're exposed to the truth. Uh, but at the end of the day, when the body bags start going home uh, to Russia in large numbers, uh, I mean, think about losing maybe 3,000 in three, two or three weeks. It's an enormous it's an enormous number of people. That's going to have a deleterious effect, obviously, on the polity inside Russia. And some, something may happen as a result of that. Don't forget also that the kind of conflict that existed in, in, in Afghanistan, with both the United States on the one hand uh, being there and the Russians on the other, is very much different than the conflict that's taking place right now in Ukraine. In Ukraine, it's extremely violent. Both sides have precision-guided weapons any tank weapons, any aircraft weapons, and more to come. It also has a concentrated population in cities that, that Afghanistan yes. didn't have. So the casualties, extremely high on both sides, and particularly against Russians, on the Russian side. And those numbers will be coming home to Russia in fairly short order, Mehdi. Yes, and Java, just circling back to something I mentioned earlier, this fear that with Afghanistan, the insurgency was successful in ejecting the Soviets, but then it, many of those fighters, some of those fi worst fighters in that group, turned against the West. Uh, you have far-right militias, you have the Azov Battalion and others fighting against the Russians. If you flood that country with weapons, once the war is over, what do some of those far-right groups, far-right foreign fighters who are heading for Ukraine, we're told by experts, what do they do? Well, that's where uh, Western intelligence services and, and uh, my former colleagues in, in the U.S. intelligence community need to be on the lookout for that. And there need to be mechanisms um, put in place now to ensure that these weapons don't go to the, the wrong side of the ledger uh, in the fight uh, against Russia right now. And if they do, that they're... There's a way to, to monitor those people, make sure that um, you can track them when they're when they're going across a border. And even for Americans who are uh, potentially trying to get there, who have extremist backgrounds, we need to make sure those people either don't come back into the country or if they do, um, that we can absolutely understand what they're doing, because we don't want to see another Al Qaeda like 
uh, emergence of no. an international terrorist uh, element um, um, come from this conflict. And Jack, Javid mentioned there, Americans, you uh, commanded troops in war, and now there are hundreds, maybe thousands of American military veterans raring to volunteer to fight with the Ukrainians against the Russians on the ground. As a retired soldier, is that a good idea? What would you say to those veterans if you had the chance? Well, they're free to do whatever they want, but it's, a, it's not a particularly good idea to have Americans fighting Russians inside Ukraine. Uh, there is one thing that Mr. Ali mentioned that's really important and we should remember, and that is the flow of intelligence information that's coming from the United States and our Western allies to the fighters in Ukraine. If there's one thing other than ammunition and food, anti-tank weapons, anti-aircraft weapons that we can provide that's really, really important to the success of the resistance against the Russians... It's this intelligence, Mehdi. We'll have to leave it there on that note. Colonel Jack Jacobs, Javed Ali, thank you so much for, to both of you for your analysis. Appreciate it. Peace talks between Russia and Ukraine's top diplomats made no progress today, sadly, as Russian shelling of Ukrainian cities continued. But how long can Ukrainians on the ground hold out? I'll speak to a Ukrainian lawmaker live from that country next. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine enters its third week, peace talks between the two countries ended with no progress today. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and his Ukrainian counterpart met in Turkey in an attempt to negotiate a ceasefire and allow civilians in the port city of Mariupol to evacuate via a humanitarian corridor. Mariupol has been under constant siege from Russian forces and the situation for residents there is growing more dire by the day. Ukrainian officials say humanitarian aid is unable to get in and civilians are unable to get out. Shelling continued in the city today, one day after an attack on a children's hospital there killed at least three people, including a child, according to local officials. The attack stirred international outrage and accusations that Russia is committing war crimes. Today, Russia's foreign minister dismissed the allegations, claiming the hospital was housing a radical militia group. This is not the first time we have seen pathetic outcries concerning so-called atrocities by the Russian armed forces. At the UN Security Council, our delegation presented facts that this maternity hospital had long since been captured by the Azov Battalion and other radical factions, from where all expected mothers, all nurses and all personnel had been kicked out. This was a base of the ultra-radical Azov Battalion. The video, of course, tells a different story, with mothers holding their infants, children crying, and pregnant women carried out on stretches. As Ukraine desperately tries to open evacuation routes from Mariupol, President Vladimir Zelensky says about 60,000 people were evacuated from other areas of Ukraine yesterday. So far, more than 2.3 million people, 2.3 million, have fled Ukraine, at least half of them children, according to UNICEF. The vast majority of those refugees have been welcomed across Poland's border. And NBC's Ellison Barber joins us now from Krakow, Poland. Ellison, thanks so much for coming on the show. You've been following the journey of some of these refugees. And in Krakow, some of those very refugees have become volunteers, right? Yeah, it's really amazing. I mean, it's one of those few moments of bright lights or at least a moment where you just pause and you think, OK, there are still good people out there. We have been to six different border crossings along the Polish-Ukrainian border. And then we were coming to Krakow because we're sort of following the, the path that some refugees take. A lot of people, when they cross, they are not staying in these border towns. They are boarding trains and then making their way to bigger cities like Krakow. And both on the border at makeshift refugee sites and then at makeshift shelters here in Krakow, we have met people who they have fled Ukraine. They themselves are refugees, but instead of moving on past the initial help points, they have made the decision to stay put because one, they hope they're going to be able to go home soon. But two, if they speak another language like Polish, they think they can be of help. And so they want to stay to help fellow Ukrainians. Listen to what one woman told us earlier today. I came from Ukraine, from Odessa, I think three or four days ago, came with my daughter. And uh, I just want to stay here and help people, help refugees from Ukraine. Why want to help when you're dealing with a lot too? Uh, because I can help, that's why I want to help. Because I have time, I want to do something for my people because I see 
people's stories is more sad than my story. That's why I want to be helpful here. As we have met people in recent days, one question we try to ask them every time is whether or not they have seen any indications of those humanitarian corridors being honored or any sense they have that Russian army, uh, Russian troops are allowing civilians to leave. And time and time again, we hear stories about civilians being targeted, people talking about being in buses with other civilians fleeing their community, trying to make their way to Poland, and then buses within sort of their cargo being targeted by shelling. Mehdi. Alison, thanks so much for your reporting. Please do stay safe. Appreciate it. Let's turn now to Ina Sovson, a Ukrainian member of parliament who's near Kyiv. Uh, Ina, thanks so much for coming back on the show. You are near the capital city, which has strongly resisted Russian forces so far. What are things on the ground where you are right now? What are they like? Well, it, it is tense. Uh, from uh, We basically are expecting whether the Russian forces will manage to get into the city of Kyiv. Uh, there are some, uh, well, optimistic signs. Just uh, yesterday, uh, the Ukrainian army did uh, defeat Russian forces on the northeast uh, cities around uh, Kyiv. So that has given us hope that uh, actually Ukrainian army is uh, well, uh, is doing well in terms of defending the city. But of course, what they have done to the cities around Kyiv particularly the city of Irpin and Bucha, is just terrifying. So nobody wants to see the same in Kyiv. Uh, Kyiv is very quiet. Uh, we do hear air raid sirens uh, uh, now and then, uh, but no major targets are being hit. So the air defense uh, in Kyiv seems to be functioning. But of course, uh, seeing what is happening in other cities, particularly in Mariupol, is just, is just so painful. It's unbelievable that this is actually happening. And uh, this attack on the maternity and child hospital is is, is uh, it, it's just terrifying, frankly speaking. But what is even more uh, terrifying is that we heard about this attack on the uh, child and maternity hospital basically two hours after we heard another news from the uh, city mayor's office in Mariupol. Uh, they did the, some calculations and uh, they now know that uh, 1,200 people died during the first two weeks of blockade of Mariupol in the Mariupol city alone. 1,200 people died. And then two hours after we heard that number and we were still shocked by that, we, we saw the pictures from, from that hospital hit. And th this is just, um, it, it pains me so much to see. I, I feel so much for those people. I. I I really don't understand how this can be the reality we are living in, but apparently that is what it is. And then today I heard from the mayor of Mariupol, and he said that during the day today, and we are 2.20 in the morning here in Kyiv, during the day Russian uh, aviation, Russian um, uh, helicopters and airplanes were um, uh, flying over the city basically every 30 minutes, bombarding other sites in the city, particularly so, in residential so areas. So, Ina, a U.S. official says Russian forces are still capable of battling uh, to go after Kiev for four to six weeks. That assessment, we should say, is very fluid. It changes often. There's been a lot of discussion around uh, what Ukraine needs to hold off the Russians. Uh, there's talk of creating a no-fly zone. The president of Ukraine keeps saying we need a no-fly zone. The U.S. and NATO says, no, we cannot do a no-fly zone because that would involve direct engagement with Russian forces. That would risk World War III. That might even risk a nuclear exchange. What is your response to that argument when you hear it from Western nations? Well, first of all, uh, why no-fly zone is so important? Because the Russian army cannot really fight Ukrainians on the ground. They're losing on the ground. They cannot proceed any further on the ground because Ukrainian army is so committed, so well prepared, and well, yes, partially well equipped uh, with the support from our Western allies. And we are truly grateful for that. I'm, I don't mean to be ungrateful. But because they cannot fight us on the ground, they're using uh, the air in order to, uh, to fight us, particularly the civilian population. They're hitting uh, residential areas, hospitals, uh, schools. Over 200 schools have been destroyed by the airstrikes here in Ukraine. And uh, we are absolutely sure that if we have the sky covered, we do have a winning chance in this war. And we hear the arguments on the, um, the Western side saying that if they want, they will get directly involved in that, uh, in, in ensuring the no-fly zone. This can lead to an escalation of conflict. Well, there seems to be a way to avoid that, uh, which is uh, to let us 
ensure the no-fly zone by ourselves. Our pilots are willing to do that. Our army is willing to do that. All we need is just technology, the fighter jets and the air defense system. And then our army can surely do that ourselves. Trust me, we are extremely committed. And, and I think that the Ukrainian yes. army did prove that it's completely able of doing that ourselves. So all we're asking for is fighter you know. jets and air defense system to do that. Last question. We heard Russia repeatedly claim it's not targeting civilians, even though images from the ground clearly show otherwise. But it's not just Russian propaganda you have to deal with. It's also some right-wing U.S. lawmakers. Have a listen to North Carolina Congressman Madison Cawthorn uh, in a clip that came out today. Remember that Zelensky is a thug. Remember that the Ukrainian government is incredibly corrupt and it is incredibly evil and it has been pushing woke ideologies. Cawthorn's spokesman says he does support Ukraine and President Zelensky, and he was expressing his displeasure at how foreign leaders, including Zelensky, had recently used false propaganda to entice America into becoming involved in an overseas conflict. That's the quote from his spokesperson. What is your response to hearing a Republican lawmaker referring to President Zelensky as the thug and et cetera, et cetera? I really don't think that should be an issue to be discussed. We do have children being killed here by Russian forces every day. And I wish uh, the world would discuss that, the atrocities of the Russian president, uh, how the Russian president is a thug and how he is actually killing thousands of people, innocent people who had not, who had done nothing to provoke that. So I really, really wish uh, we should concentrate on that. I do understand that Russian propaganda machine is working, uh, but I really think that uh, in this situation, it's pretty black and white case where there is one country which has been attacked uh, completely unprovoked and another country that is attacking us and that is actually threatening an even worse attack like chemical weapon being used. I do think that is a pretty black and white situation and I really, really wish uh, the whole world uh, would, would stay on the white side of that. Ina Sofsen, thank you so much for your time. Please do stay safe. Still to come, Ukrainian calls for the U.S. to establish a no-fly zone, as you just heard there, are very understandable. But to actually enforce one could create an existential risk for the entire world. So what are the actual risks of this crisis escalating into a nuclear confrontation? I'll talk to an expert in just 60 seconds. Don't go away. A moment ago, before the break, you heard a Ukrainian member of parliament make a very passionate case to the US and its NATO allies to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Many people across Ukraine, including President Zelensky, have made the case that they cannot win this war against Russia and save Ukrainian civilians without imposing a no-fly zone or closing the sky, as they're calling it. We are speaking about closing the sky. You can't decide to close or not to close. You can't decide. If you are united against the Nazism and this terror, you have to close. How do we just turn a blind eye to that kind of plea? Reject a desperate call for a very specific kind of help in the face of an unfolding humanitarian crisis and possible war crimes? The problem, though, is that no matter how emotionally compelled we may feel to help Ukraine survive this Russian invasion, we have to think through the potential consequences, especially when we're talking about a conflict that involves a nuclear armed power. Recently, talk has, talk has turned to a so-called limited no-fly zone. 27 foreign policy experts, former diplomats, generals, etc., wrote a letter to President Biden this week urging his administration to impose no-fly zones, but only over the humanitarian evacuation corridors that Ukraine and Russia agree to. And they added that they're not in search of, quote, confrontation with Russia, but to avert and deter Russian bombardment that would result in massive loss of Ukrainian lives. So far, Joe Biden and NATO have completely ruled this out because even if we're talking about only shooting down Russian aircraft if they attack civilians over a certain area, we're still talking about shooting down Russian aircraft. The limited part only refers to location. We'd officially still be at war with Russia if we did that. And don't take that from me. Putin himself said it. He said to any nation declaring a no-fly zone, quote, that very second we will view them as participants of the military conflict and it would not matter what members they are. Should we not take Putin's threat seriously? What reasons do we have to believe he won't actually go to war with the US and its NATO allies? That he won't escalate this to a nuclear war? Have a listen to retired Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman make his argument last night on MSNBC. 
I have very good confidence based on my firsthand experience that the Russians are not going to try to provoke uh, or, or escalate to a, a direct confrontation when they're already bogged down in Ukraine. That is a huge leap between uh, us supporting Ukraine with additional are you material. Colonel are, Colonel, are you confident that Vladimir Putin would not escalate to the use of tactical nuclear weapons within Ukraine and wipe out Ukraine beyond recognition in response to any escalation by the United States? That is that is uh, that is a difficult question to answer because there is no nuclear response from Ukraine. So, are you convinced Putin won't attack? If you did not find that reassuring, you're not alone. In fact, as some have pointed out, the arguments are so unclear that they seem like they're out of an article from The Onion at the start of the U.S. invasion of Iraq that was titled, This war will destabilize the entire Mideast region and set off a global shockwave of anti-Americanism versus, no, it won't. Well, we know how that turned out. I know we're a country that was rushing to take our masks off even at the height of this pandemic, but now is not the time to ignore risk. As Zach Beecham writes in Vox, there is no coherent moral view in which it would be better to stop Russian planes from bombing Kyiv while significantly raising the risk of a nuclear war. Kyiv is notably located on planet Earth. So how can we be so sure that a no-fly zone wouldn't risk nuclear war? And what does this mean for nuclear proliferation going forward? Has this talk of Armageddon made clear the risks that nuclear weapons still very much pose and reminded us why we should get rid of them? Or has the war made nukes seem like a must-have for smaller nations to protect themselves? Joining me now to discuss all this is John Wolfstahl. Under President Obama, he was the senior director at the National Security Council for Nonproliferation and Arms Control. Currently, he's a senior advisor at Global Zero, a nonpartisan group advocating for the elimination of all nuclear weapons and a board member of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. John, thanks so much for coming on the show this evening. We have to walk this fine line between alarmism and complacency. But you're the expert. How worried are you right now about the risk of the war in Ukraine escalating into, God forbid, a nuclear exchange? Well, first, thanks for having me on, Betty. I'm sorry it's under such difficult circumstances. Um, look, I've spent my whole life in uh, Washington working on the threat of nuclear war and escalation, both when the Soviet Union existed and, and ever since. So I worry about it regularly. Uh, I'm a lot more worried now that we have a conflict in Ukraine uh, which could easily spill over, and uh, that could escalate beyond people's control in ways that we don't anticipate. It's not just yes. that Vladimir Putin has threatened the use of nuclear weapons. It's not just that NATO is working very hard to support Ukraine without getting directly drawn in. Um, but it's, in any conflict, things go sideways. There are events, like the shelling of the ZNPP nuclear power plant or the seizure of Chernobyl that sets people off. Um, you could have third-party hackers. We're seeing Ukrainian and Russian hackers try to vie for some role in this conflict, uh, and, and that could come from outside the conflict. And then things could just be misinterpreted. So I do worry about it a lot, especially when the United States and Russia have both said they reserve the right to use nuclear weapons first in a conflict. It's such a good point you make there about things going sideways. Even if Putin and even if the West didn't want to do it, it could happen accidentally, inadvertently, unwittingly, etc. John, you've seen the letter sent to Joe Biden calling for a limited no-fly zone. There are some big names on there. Retired General Philip Breedlove, former uh, Supreme Com Commander of NATO, former Ambassador to Ukraine Bill Taylor, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO Kurt Volker. Are you convinced by this letter? Does it make the case, in your view, that there's no reason to believe Putin would attack the U.S. or use his new nuclear arsenal if the West went to war with him via a new fly zone, a limited no fly zone? So I, I know many of the people on the letter, and I respect their expertise greatly. And I respect the fact that they, like, I hope everybody watching are desperate to do what they can to help the Ukrainian people uh, with this brutal onslaught. But I'm not convinced that it actually is a manageable risk. Um, people are trying to find some way to stop Russia from slaughtering Ukrainians. Uh, and I, having watched over the last two weeks, I don't believe that stopping Russian aircraft will stop that slaughter. Russia has long-range missiles, uh, multiple launch rocket systems, many different ways that they can target civilians. What I do know is that if we want to enforce a no-fly zone, even a limited one, Russia uses Russian-based missile defenses and air defenses in order to protect their aircraft. And before the president of the United States is going to send American or NATO airplanes over Ukraine to enforce it, he is going to need to eliminate those missile launching sites in Russia. 
So before we even get planes off the ground, we are bombing Russia, which means we are escalating this conflict. And I just don't see how you can get from here to there, despite the fact that it's an important thing to, to work through. Uh, John, you had a Twitter thread earlier this week in which you point to a sober reality. Uh, you say, we are at the mercy of a Russian dictator with 5,000-plus nuclear weapons. And you argue government and security officials have told us that having nukes keep us safe. The only security remained in abolition. Is abolition of nuclear weapons really possible at this point? Ukraine gave up its part of the Soviet nuclear weapons stockpile in 1994, and it's now been invaded. Iraq, Libya gave up WND programs, got invaded. If you're Iran looking at this situation, aren't you probably thinking, what's the benefit of not building a nuclear weapon right now? So there are two parts of that problem. The first is the easy one, which is, is it possible? Technically, we know how to get rid of nuclear weapons. Uh, more countries have given up nuclear weapon programs that have actually built nuclear weapon arsenals. We know how to verify the elimination of weapons. It's a question of political will, not a question of technology or inventing something we don't have. The larger, more difficult question is, are we behaving in a way that will uh, achieve that goal? And the answer is clearly not. Countries with nuclear weapons are addicted to them. They believe falsely that they bring security when, in fact, they are the very things that threaten our existence. Uh, and we have seen time and time again the, the meter flip where five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, we were worried about Donald Trump with nuclear weapons. Now we feel more comfortable with Joe Biden, with his experience and his mentality, but we're very concerned about Vladimir Putin. And there is no good guy with nukes. It's like the myth of a good guy with a gun. Uh, if they're laying around, if people have them, they will rely on them and they can be used. And the only way to eliminate the threat that nuclear weapons will be used to hold our conventional capabilities at bay um, or through an accident or unintended escalation is for their elimination. You say abolition would be straightforward. It just requires political will. How would it actually work? Who would take the first steps in terms of the big powers? How would world leaders disassemble their nuclear weapons? Would it be all together on the count of three? I mean, sorry to be facetious, but how would it actually work? So, no, it, it is a complicated issue. And I don't mean to say, say that it's simplistic. In fact, we have a 40-page plan. If you go to globalzero.org and download the action plan, uh, it actually lays out specifically step by step. Um, we had premised the, the initial part of that plan on building off of U.S.-Russian negotiated arms control. That clearly is not going to be happening in the near future. Um, but there are a number of things the United States alone can do and the United States allies can do. For example, we see right now that we are not going to benefit for the United States threatening to use nuclear weapons first. There's no military requirement. We're not going to drop nuclear weapons on Russia first. We're not going to drop them on Ukraine first. And so simply eliminating that as a strategy means that we can significantly reduce the number of nuclear weapons we have, regardless of what Russia has. That's not very popular, but we can still maintain submarines at sea and bombers that can destroy Russia 10 times over and not have a first use strategy. Then we can begin to put pressure on Russia and China by leading the world away from these weapons. But it's not a simplistic exercise. The reality is, however, that right now we think nuclear weapons can do things that they can't. We think that they can be used like a Swiss army knife to coerce Russia into not attacking Ukraine, or that they can be used in response to a conventional attack. And the only thing that nuclear weapons are good for at all is deterring an attack on us and our allies by nuclear weapon. That's where I think Joe Biden wants to go, uh, and quite frankly, where the nuclear establishment in the United States is fighting him, uh, to say, no, 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 we can't possibly take this risk because we'll be seen as vulnerable or our allies will be seen uh, as us walking away from them. And I, I just don't think yeah. that that bears out scrutiny. Fascinating, if depressing stuff. John Wolfstar, thank you so much for your analysis tonight. We appreciate it. When we come back, it's a tale of two thoroughly weird American presidents, each reacting to an existential crisis. One is Donald Trump, the other is played brilliantly by Meryl Streep. And I wish I could say that her fictional portrayal was the more deeply unhinged, but here we are. Coming up, Trump's bizarre comments on Ukraine. But before that, my conversation with Oscar-nominated Don't Look Up screenwriter and director Adam McKay. You don't want to miss this. It's on the other side of this break. What if I told you that if we don't stop burning fossil fuels at our current pace, entire cities are at risk of disappearing underwater, that record floods and heat waves will threaten our food and water supplies, that if nothing changes, the effects of climate change could outpace our human ability to adapt? That's exactly what it says in the latest UN report on climate change, an alarming study that the UN Secretary General described 
as an atlas of human suffering. And you'd think the logical response would be to seize this moment for green and renewable energy, to do everything in our power to cut pollution and wean ourselves off of climate-damaging fossil fuels. But with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which happened just three days before that UN report came out, and a US ban on Russian oil imports earlier this week, prices at the pump are rising fast, so naturally Republicans, fossil fuel lobbyists, and of course Senator Joe Manchin, are seizing the opportunity to call for more drilling here at home. Don't get away from all oil, just foreign oil. That's madness. And it's the kind of infuriating climate denialism, including the kind of denialism you see in some parts of my industry, the media, that's deftly parodied in Adam McKay's dark comedy, Don't Look Up, which was just nominated for four Oscars. According to NASA's computers, that object is going to hit the Pacific Ocean at 62 miles due west off the coast of Chile. And then what happens? Like a tidal wave? No. It will be far more catastrophic. There will, there will be mile-high tsunamis fanning out all across the globe. If this comet makes impact, it will have the power of, of, of a billion Hiroshima bombs. There will be magnitude... 10 or 11 earthquakes. You're, you're breathing weird. It's, it's, uh, it's making me uncomfortable. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to articulate the science. I know, but it's like so stressful. I like trying to like listen. I don't what... think you understand the gravity of the situation. I spoke with Don't Look Up director and screenwriter Adam McKay, who also directed the 2018 movie on Dick Cheney Vice earlier. Adam, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. Uh, before we get into talking about the movie in which a deadly world-ending comet is a pretty, pretty good allegory for climate change in many ways, I have to ask about gas prices, because we're about to see gas prices go up even more as Russian oil is banned. It's a big story in America right now. The response from a lot of folks in D.C. is, we need to rely on more domestic oil production rather than we need to fix our reliance on oil to begin with, that we need to switch to renewables. The whole conversation around this is kind of mad, isn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. And, and, and it shows that our leaders are not taking... Uh, the climate crisis seriously. If we were, we would have been preparing for this for you know decades beforehand. That a lack of oil wouldn't have been a problem. Uh, you're starting to see a lot of car companies uh, switch over to electric vehicles. You're starting to see, as you know, uh, renewable energy is now cheaper than fossil fuels for the most part. Uh, but the idea that our leaders respond like like it's 1983 is a, a bit disheartening. Yeah, the idea that we just yeah, need to rely on more domestic oil rather than foreign oil, which seems a bit bizarre. So let's talk about Don't Look Up. Did you think a dark comedy about a comet and two scientists, even two scientists played by Jennifer Lawrence and Leo DiCaprio, would end up becoming, I think, the second most watched film ever on Netflix and get four Oscar nominations, including Best Picture? Has the huge response to this film surprised you? Yeah, I mean, with every movie you make, you kind of have a, a, you know, a personal thing that you're feeling and you put it out there and you hope that you're not crazy. Uh, so once the movie went worldwide, I was astounded by the response. I mean, I have never, I mean, it's, it's ultimately a comedy, even though there's tragic undertones and, and dramatic moments. Yes. And to yes. see the movie be number one in like 87 countries, including Pakistan, Nigeria, Vietnam, it, 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 it blew us away. But it was also very heartening uh, because it told us that a lot of people feel the same way, which is that we're not getting the macro truth about where the planet's at, where our leadership is at, where corruption is at. And uh, it, it, it was something I've never experienced before. So 
Adam, I thoroughly enjoyed and appreciated the movie, but it does have its critics. Uh, Eric Levitz, for example, writing in New York Magazine, says the movie is a poor allegory for the climate crisis because unlike a comet, climate change provides us with neither a hard deadline nor a clean binary between success and failure. He says, nor is there existing technology that can just defeat it, as you could with a comet in the movie, if the politicians and billionaires had just listened to the scientists. What is your response to criticisms like that? Well, I would just say that, you know, Jonathan Swift's modest proposal where he proposed eating poor children is probably not the perfect <laughs> allegory or metaphor for how to deal with poverty. Yes, that's the whole point. Uh, what we were trying to do was to focus on the human response. So, you know, when I read those criticisms, uh, you know, people have their opinions, have them you know, all day long. But I think I, I would respectfully say to that writer, they're, they're missing the point. You have a history, Adam, of skewering the news media, especially television news. I'm thinking of the two Anchorman movies. Uh, perhaps the most memorable moment in Don't Look Up is when the graduate student who discovered the comet, played by Jennifer Lawrence, loses it live on air with two morning show hosts. Have a watch. How big is this thing? Could it like destroy someone's house? Is that possible? Well, Comet Didiaski, which is what it will officially be named, is somewhere. After her, after her. Yeah, after yeah, her. Yeah. Oh, what an honor. Yeah, right. Congratulations. It's somewhere between six and nine kilometers across. So it, it's big. It would damage the the entire planet, not just a house. You know. The entire planet. Okay. Well, as it's damaging, will it hit this one house in particular that's right on the coast of New Jersey? It's my ex-wife's house. I need it to be hit. Oh, Can we make you, that happen? You surely have a great relationship. <laughs> no, you stop. Listen, in all you need to stop. I will, but in all fairness, I actually paid for, for the step. house. I'm so sorry. I'm yes. sorry. Are we uh, are we not being clear? We're trying to tell you that the entire planet is about to be destroyed. Okay. okay. Um, well, it's, um, you know, just something we do around here. You know, we just keep the bad news light. Right. It helps the medicine go down. <laughs> It's a genius and hilarious clip. Uh, but on a serious note, how much do you think the media is responsible for our failure to take the threat of climate change seriously? Because a lot of well-intentioned people, well-intentioned people in my industry would say, it's just hard to get the public interested in this story. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting point. I mean, any time you're talking about fire tornadoes, rain bombs, Derechko's. I mean, these are things out of science fiction movies that are currently hitting the world. I, when I hear that you don't know how to get ratings off of that, I start to wonder. I start to have some questions uh, because <laughs> I guarantee you we could write a movie about rain bombs and fire tornadoes that would get a lot of people to watch it. So I, I think what's happened with uh, the climate crisis, it's so vast, it's so unimaginable that it blows through yeah. the formats that we've created of digestible news, clicks. So I, I don't point towards any one person as doing something terrible. I think we're confronting something that is beyond anything we've ever confronted. The closest you can come is the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I would say that is a good starting point for the emotional timbre that we should have when it comes to talking about climate, because this isn't 50 years, this isn't 80 years in the future. Yeah. We just saw an IPCC report, which is one of the most conservative scientific reports yes. you can see, that is now throwing around 18 years. And I've seen other models that are throwing around the number eight years. So we gotta wake up, we gotta freak out, but at the same time, we gotta like snap into action. And that was a so, lot of the fun we were having in our movie was we were just laughing at, at how we're confronting the greatest challenge in human history. Yet uh, I'm looking at video of a bear climbing into a hot tub, which, by the way, is very enjoyable. 
It is the greatest challenge in human history. So was it ironic to you or just annoying to you, maybe, that you made a film about how the media won't cover this huge substantive issue that is climate change? And a lot of the media coverage about the movie when it came out became all about your split with actor Will Ferrell, your former creative partner. Was that ironic? Was that annoying? What was that to you? <laughs> I mean, it was my whole experience of rolling the movie out uh, was something else. It, it wasn't just the Will Ferrell stuff. It was something I tweeted that people pounced on and misinterpreted. And I mean, the whole thing, now that I have distance on it, it's perfect. I mean, it's just perfect. But, you know, the truth is, with this story, I, I think a lot of us think it's just a, an issue among issues. And it's not. It's it, and I only say this not because I'm Adam McKay, the guy who did Step Brothers. Don't listen to me. I'm yes. I'm reading the scientists. I'm talking to the scientists, and what I'm hearing is a, a thousand times worse than what we're hearing on the day in day out news cycle, and what we're hearing from our leaders. You can tell the way our leaders talk about this. They don't get it. They don't get what this is really going to do. And, and there was a study that just came out from uh, Climate Analytics, very reputable modeling company yeah. for climate futures. I don't know if you've met if you've heard this, but it said that in eight years, half of our days will be once every hundred year heat events. That just came out. I didn't see any coverage of it at all. I mean, we have to have mayors talking about power grids. We've got to be talking about renewables, but yet it just yes, flew do. right by the 24-hour news cycle. Yeah, um, and I say that as a as the host of a show, we are all guilty of this in the media. That it's just. Uh, it's something we do need to freak out more about and try and inspire people to action. I appreciate you making this movie. One last question before I let you go. I have to ask, you also made the 2018 movie Vice, starring Christian Bale as then Vice President Dick Cheney. What do you make, Adam, of the rehabilitation of the Cheney family? Not just Liz, who's been standing up to Trump, but Dick himself, who turned up at the House on the 1-6 anniversary, had a bunch of Democratic members lining up to shake his hand. Well, I mean, that's why we made the movie. Uh, that was exactly why we made the movie. There was this weird sweep it under the carpet thing going on in America uh, from some quarters of our, our media and our leaders. And I just don't think we should ever forget that it's one of the greatest crimes in human history. Depending on the estimates, you're talking between 700,000 to a million people died for no reason. There was no provocation. There were no weapons of mass destruction. That's been proven. So we made that movie, and and part of part of what that movie was about, if it, you know, and many I'm sure you've seen it, is the media coverage. I mean, by the time that we went yes. to war with Iraq, 76 percent of Americans supported that war. That's a media problem, not to mention a leadership problem. So. Yeah, the movies and the things we're doing now are, are, are trying to, you know, go at these difficult subjects. Whether you think they're successful or not is fine, but uh, that's kind of what we're looking at. Well, I, for one, appreciate you doing it. Adam McKay, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Matty. Before we go tonight, a lot of voices are weighing in on where Russia's war in Ukraine could be headed on what Putin's endgame is, on the wisdom of imposing or enforcing a no-fly zone, on the risks of nuclear escalation. And as you might imagine, there are many, many opinions being expressed by former top officials, people who have been in the Situation Room. So if you want to know why this war is happening and where it goes next, who better to check in with than a former president of the United States? How does this all end? Is this going to be like a long-term thing? How do you see it unfolding? Well, I, and I said this a long time ago, if this happens... Uh, we are uh, playing right into their hands, the green energy, the windmills, they don't work. They're too expensive. They kill all the birds. They ruin your landscapes. And yet the environmentalists love the windmills. And I've been preaching this for years, the windmills, and I had them way down. But the windmills are the most expensive energy you can have. Uh, and they don't work. You'd get better analysis from that weird uncle that you only see at Thanksgiving. You know the one. 
Forget NATO sovereignty, energy crises, international law, windmills. It's all about the windmills. Trump's playlist of maybe five topics that he regularly rants about is tired and woefully, shamefully, ridiculously inadequate. This is the guy who tens of millions of Americans want to give the nuclear codes back to come 2024. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. That does it for the Mehdi Hassan show this week. Eamon Moyudin is in the chair tomorrow night here on Peacock. And I'll see you Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern live on MSNBC, where I'll kick off another week of in-depth interviews with key newsmakers. Join us anytime on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. For now, from me, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.